This is the Language of Business, a show to inform and inspire entrepreneurs, anyone considering a startup, or a small business looking for a new idea. Hear about strategies that usually work, and strategies that often don't work, from people who've been there and done that. Our host is Gregory Stoller, Harvard MBA and Senior Lecturer at Boston University Questrom School of Business. In this episode, we go to Mass Challenge in Boston, meet the Managing Director, and three teams competing in the 2019 cohort. A service that brings healthy meals to food deserts, a security service that can be a lifesaver, and an app that can get you a retail or restaurant job within five minutes. And one of them is a $50,000 gold award winner. Here's Greg Stoller. We're talking with teams in the 2019 cohort here at Mass Challenge. Who do we have up first? Hi, so my name is Dan Wexler. I'm the executive director of Eat Well Meal Kits. And what we're doing is making healthy eating more available to families living in food and secure communities with our affordable, nutritious meal kits. What's a typical meal? It's a box with everything you need, right down to the oil, meat, and spices to cook a nutritious family dinner for five people for only $15. What we do is we distribute our meal kits from community partners in food and secure communities like housing centers, community centers, and farmers markets. So they're sometimes known as food deserts. They're communities where there is one or sometimes no grocery stores, healthy food, and often any food in these communities are very expensive. And so we provide fresh, easy, and affordable dinner options. The recipe development really starts in the community. And we spend a lot of time working with residents to understand what tastes and flavors they like, what foods they want to be eating, and the challenges that they're having. And then our recipes are designed by our two-star Michelin chef, and they're all in line with the USDA dietary guidelines. So you could have something like our chicken pot pie pasta, which is a pound of chicken, box of pasta, peas, corn, celery, carrots, onions, and all of the seasonings and other ingredients that you need to make a 30-minute one-pot meal. How does it differ from Blue Apron? So our recipes or our meal kits are uh, $15 to feed five people. It comes out to be $3 a serving as compared to Blue Apron, which is about $8 per serving. Blue Apron and and similar services tend to be a bit more elaborate. I've used Blue Apron and the food was pretty good, but I definitely took a long time to make and used about every dish in my kitchen. So ours is designed to just be quick and simple. Additionally, rather than doing delivery, we sell our meal kits right from these community partners, YMCA's, health centers, and things like that. So it's a much more accessible and affordable option for these families. How did you end up at Mass Challenge? So we were in uh, an accelerator before this, and they recommended us applying to Mass Challenge because we're a very socially missioned organization, and we know that Mass Challenge is really interested in expanding their social impact, and they have just a really great uh, wealth of resources in terms of mentors and partners who are really eager to give us advice and direction on the problems that we're trying to solve. <sighs> 25 million Americans live in food deserts. Supermarkets are far, healthy food is expensive, and cooking is not easy. But what if there was a way to make dinner easy without sacrificing quality or flavor? Introducing Eat Well Meal Kits, an easy and affordable way to make a fresh family dinner. Simply pick up an all-in-one meal kit at a convenient neighborhood location. Cook a 30-minute, one-pot meal with Eat Well's simple recipes and spend more time with your family instead of cleaning up. We founded Eat Well Meal Kits to make healthy eating more available to families in food deserts. First, we speak with residents in the community about the flavors they like, and then Adriana, our two-star Michelin chef, designs tasty recipes. We then package the ingredients and sell our meal kits from convenient neighborhood locations, bringing fresh food into food deserts. It's just been so, so beneficial. So we're so grateful for Eat Well. They make it easy, affordable, fast, and it's just a blessing to have them in the community and part of the markets. Eat Well doesn't only make me eat well, it makes me feel well because I don't have the mental stresses um, about having to cook meals. Food deserts have no grocery stores for a mile. And because of that, 20% of kids aren't getting the fresh food that they need. 
EatWell is changing that, but we need your help. We're launching this summer to bring our fresh meal kits to Boston. Please donate to our campaign so we can help communities make dinner easy. Big choices after college, right? Grad school, maybe? Soar from your undergraduate major to a great career in business. Biomedical engineer to healthcare analyst. Health science to clinical systems analyst. Mechanical engineer to solutions engineer. Before you know it, you can have a master's degree in management studies. Nine months and you're in business. Who do we have next? My name is Eric Kennedy. I'm the CEO and co-founder of SimpleSense, and we are an information sharing platform for emergency. So a big building like this, you call 911, an ambulance shows up, which is great, but they're at the far end of the building. What you really need to do is call security first so they can go meet the ambulance, they can come to you, they can make that whole process happen a lot faster. You mentioned the use of Knox boxes. How does that work? Yep, the fire department has the key and so they can get in. So a big problem that happens though is the keys aren't kept up to date and so the fire department will have sort of outdated information basically to get access to the building. So we charge the building owner to keep everything current and up to date. So the fire department when they're showing up has the best information. So what we do is after you call 911, we share that data that you called 911 with the building management. So the facility here, the security, they know that you called, otherwise they don't know until the ambulance is here and then you're already losing five to 10 minutes to come and find you. So we share it with them right away. So everybody knows right away and eventually they can share floor plans back with the first responders. They can start to send information back and forth securely Sort of like Dropbox, but for that emergency. Every minute that goes by reduces your chance of survival by 10%. So five minutes is a really big deal. How did you wind up at Mass Challenge? Uh, so we've been through a couple different accelerators. So Reno, Nevada is where we started in 2017. And then last year we were at a security accelerator in Erie, PA. Did our first test there with the Fortune 500, with the fire department there, the police department. And that brought us to here this summer. Uh, who pays for it? So the enterprise pays. So our initial customer, it's sort of like you want to sell the Uber Black product, you know, the premium product first, and then figure out how to, how to bring it to the wider market. And so we're starting with enterprises because they have this problem en masse, big campuses, lots of people, lots of different buildings. A lot of times a big corporate campus will have one address. So in Google Maps, you'll see one spot for the whole campus. So if you call 911, that's where the ambulance is going. They're not coming to your building. It's a really big problem in that context. Is Avalon the type of client that you're looking for over the long term? Yeah. So a good example here in Boston is there was a woman who went to the ER. So she showed up at the ER, this is two in the morning, and the door was locked. She had to walk about 70 feet to the other door, but she couldn't make it. So she walked halfway, sat down on a bench, called 911, told them she was outside the door, and that piece of information didn't get passed on. It took them 10 minutes to find her. She ended up dying. So just that simple piece of information that she's right outside the front entrance, they didn't get, and that ended up in her death because of a 10 minute delay. That happens all the time, especially at the workplace. Eric, thank you so much for joining us on The Language of Business, and we wish you the best of luck at Mass Challenge. Hi, my name is Eric Kanegi, CEO and co-founder of SimpleSense. It's our mission to reduce the 149,000 preventable deaths that occur each year in the U.S. due to delayed emergency response. It's now 2020. We have modern technology that can reduce preventable deaths by a further 10x today. Here we are at a residence at the 300 block of West 3rd Street in Erie, Pennsylvania. A domestic argument turns violent, and a female flees the residence, running into the surgery center two blocks away. A male is in pursuit with a handgun. There are nine people in the second floor waiting area of the surgery center, along with a doctor and several nurses. Knowing the male is in pursuit, Female runs past the reception area in extreme distress, screaming that she's being chased by a man with a gun. Within the span of 60 seconds, many things happen. First, the man runs through the waiting area and three people call 911 by cell phone. Second, the male is confronted by a nurse and he shoots the nurse in the leg. And then third, he runs into an operating room where a patient is under anesthesia and in the middle of surgery. So now we have a violent man with a gun, an injured nurse, and a hostage situation. Here's the problem. Three calls went out to 911, but none of the waiting patients know to also call security. So Erie police arrive at the building. They don't know the building layout, where the office is. It takes them an extra five minutes to figure out where the shooter is actually located. Alternatively, with SimpleSense, UPMC police receive a notification 
and immediately dispatch personnel to the surgery center, which is just one block away from their main campus. They can be there in a few seconds. UPMC officers locate the shooter and secure the area before police arrive, and then sync up with Erie police officers outside immediately upon arrival, cutting five minutes and a lot of confusion out of the response time. UPMC police are now a part of the integrated response to this incident. How this works is that SimpleSense receives a digital copy of all dispatches coming out of 911. We filter those dispatches by a preset geofence around all UPMC properties, And then if there's an incident inside of one of those geofences, we send that notification ahead to UPMC security. This all happens within a half second. UPMC police and their security operations center receive notifications either via email, text, or an alert into their existing incident management software. Arriving Erie police officers can also view critical infrastructure information for the building, including floor plans, who to contact for video camera access, standard security procedures, and whatever else UPMC has preloaded into the SimpleSense platform. Integrating response between all responders, whether they're public, private, or military, is key to solving this problem at scale. And by integrating, we mean everyone involved needs to have immediate access to the most critical data. We're starting with 911 dispatch data, as knowing an incident is happening now, here, is the current largest point of failure in emergency response. Who do we have next? My name is Tony. I'm one of the co-founders of JobGet. We are essentially the fastest platform to get a job in the restaurant and retail industry. And you can kind of think of us as the Facebook for jobs, all on your mobile phone. Why we kind of focus on the restaurant, restaurant and retail industry is because currently there are 80 million job openings in the U.S. a year. 40% of them are focused on the white-collar jobs. And that's where all the big players like LinkedIn, Glassdoor, Monster, they all play in. The 60% of the people who really need help finding jobs are still using archaic platforms like Craigslist or even Help Wanted Signs. So that's why we came in. We launched about four months ago. We started with about eight employers using the platform. We thought maybe grow to 10, 20, or 30 employers. To our surprise, we actually grew from eight to over 700 employers in four months using the platform. And this includes large chains such as Dunkin' Donuts, Aubon Pang, CVS, and Taylor. That's because we really met a massive need in this market where employers need to find the right people and the right people need to find the right employers. So in terms of job seekers, we grew from about 50 to more than 3,000 job seekers in four months. And a lot of this through partnerships with organizations. So there are, you know, there are local you know, family services, there are unemployment agencies, local schools. So some of the schools we're working with is one example is Madison Park High School, which we went in, we spoke with the career counselor. He was really glad to have us because he said, you know, all our kids need jobs and right now they're going through newspaper ads and stuff. So we basically presented to classes of kids. They're all having fun using this app, getting jobs, and most of them have gotten interviews and a lot have gotten hired already. So in the span of four months, we probably got over a thousand people hired through that platform already. What makes job get the fastest? So we, we believe we're really changing the paradigm of the hiring industry. Something like a typical, like a Craigslist or Indeed, the process takes weeks because the, the, psycho- the psychology is you're going to website, you're filling out an online application, you submit an email, you don't hear back until five days later, two weeks later. Whereas literally on our app, it's instant. Create a profile in seconds, kind of like Facebook, and you apply to jobs instantaneously, and on the employers, they're on their app as well all the time. So one example is, you know, we went to a dig-in location, the employer just posted a job, and he got three applicants within literally five minutes. And he messaged around the app, and can you come in later today on the app? And people are super responsive because on mobile, you, you reply to text a lot faster. So it's very, very quick. And it's very simple to use because it's kind of very visual and a mobile format as well. Did you pick these two industries because of high turnover? High turnover, exactly. Both restaurant and retail, that's exactly right. Who pays for it? The employers do pay for it. But right now, we're trying to make it as free as possible for the Boston population because that's our, kind of our home base and just trying to help out the community as, as a whole. Are you a problem solver? Do you see the big picture and the small details? Want to turn big data 
into big decisions? Take AI to the boardroom. Translate rocket science into the science of business. Build your career at digital speed with a master of science in business analytics. Be ready for careers like analytics consultant, data science, analytics strategy, data translator, BI analyst, technical business analyst, 10 months, and you're in business analytics. You're watching the Language of Business Visit to Mass Challenge. Once again, here's Greg Stoller. The words tomato and tomato might be interchangeable, but how about incubator and accelerator? We're on location virtually with Kate Brummy, the Managing Director of Mass Challenge Boston, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here virtually. What is the difference between an incubator and an accelerator? We get this question a lot, as you can imagine. So I think of an accelerator as a time-bound program where startups are competitively selected. They participate in structured programming and mentorship over a course of time and then exit the program and go on their way. An incubator is um, often not time-bound. So it may be startups are working over multiple years in a certain space and the value add is often community. Uh, it may be deep expertise. So I think of my peer organization, Mass Robotics, as being a great example of an incubator, whereas Mass Challenge operates as an accelerator. And what is Mass Challenge all about? So Mass Challenge is a global nonprofit. Our mission is to help startups launch and grow their businesses. We believe that startups provide solutions that the world needs to drive progress and job growth. And our mission is to help founders get from that initial insight to impact. Uh, we know from our own experience in our 10 years working with founders that the journey uh, is long and hard and that founders need a community around them to, uh, to achieve their own goals. But Mass Challenge doesn't take equity in the startups in the accelerator, correct? Correct. So we provide our services to startups at no cost and for zero equity. So in that regard, how does Mass Challenge, quote unquote, make money? So we are fortunate to be supported by a community of actors. So we have uh, been supported by government, where we play an important role in supporting local innovation ecosystems, strengthening clusters of, of innovation. Uh, we're supported by uh, philanthropy, individuals uh, and foundations who see us uh, as an integral part of local economic development and believe in entrepreneurs as essential to progress and growth. And then we're also supported by corporates. So in fact, more than 60% of our revenue is directly from corporate or industry who are looking to be closer to innovation, closer to the inventors who can help them identify the breakthrough technologies or solutions that can improve their businesses or deliver new value to their customers. And mass challenges also all over the world, correct? We are. So we were founded in Boston 10 years ago. It remains our headquarters. Our hearts are here, but we are located now in seven locations around the world. So Rhode Island, two locations in Texas, Mexico, Switzerland, and Israel. At Mass Challenge Boston, you put all of the startups into a cohort. What exactly is a cohort? Each year we scour the world for the top highest growth startups. So we run a com competitive process uh, startups uh, apply to Mass Challenge. Uh, they'll go through two rounds of judging, so are vetted by experts in our community who help us identify the highest growth, highest potential startups. And here in Boston, we ultimately work with a hundred of these, uh, the, representing less than 10% of the applications we receive. This is what we call our cohort each year. So every year you've got a hundred startups in a single cohort and talk us through what happens then during the cohort experience. Startups go through, first of all, an intensive boot camp experience. Our primary goal when they arrive at Mass Challenge is to help them diagnose where they are as an early stage startup, set business goals that uh, are achievable and relevant for their next uh, value inflection point and then to develop a plan for their mass challenge engagement that is relevant for their goals. So we are a focused high expectations program in that regard. Following that boot camp period, startups have access to, we think unrivaled uh, expertise and curriculum. So startups will uh, work directly with a team of mentors that they identify within our, our incredible pool of volunteer mentors they access curriculum uh, from experts around the world. Being virtual has allowed us to think 
even beyond geography in terms of the individuals who can bring unique insights and relevant experience to our startups. We open our network to founders so that they can navigate to customers, potential uh, constituents, stakeholders, investors that can help grow their business. And then the last is we try and build community around them. So we spend time within our program helping make peer-to-peer -peer connections, recognizing it's not only about network and expertise and capital, but founders need to be resilient and become leaders. And so part of our program is focused on that as well. After a startup graduates, how do you or they define their success? It's a really important question that we spend a lot of time thinking about. We are outcomes focused in how we do our work. Long term, we think about that on a couple dimensions, uh, revenue, funding, and job growth. Uh, we look at all three of those because as a non-equity sell accelerator, we're not only focused on the venture-backed startups, but we're focused on all startups with scale potential. Specific to six months out of the accelerator, we want to see their business growth. So as we work with startups when they enter the accelerator, throughout, and when they exit, we're looking for meaningful progression in their business readiness along the dimensions of customer discovery, product, market, scale, financing. And do they keep in touch with Mass Challenge even six months after they've graduated? Many do, which makes us very pleased. So we, uh, we work to remain uh, an open door to our startups. We have many who continue to be part of our alumni community. They live on Slack. They support each other. They come back to our staff for support, resource, and network. Many of them will continue to work with their mentors that they met over a long period of time. And increasingly, we're seeing our alumni come back to peer mentor their, uh, their next the next cohort. So this year we have uh, almost 20 alumni who are actively mentoring uh, startups in our current cohort. You just started the 2020 cohort. Who won in 2019? So we had an incredible group of startups last year. We gave away over a million in cash prizes. Uh, we had startups win across life sciences, uh, software, data security, and JobGet was just one of those startups. Oh, that's terrific. Congratulations to Tony Leo. Absolutely. Kate, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Kate Brummy, the Managing Director of Mass Challenge Boston. So what does it take to win at Mass Challenge? We're back on location here on Dry Dock Avenue with a gold medal finalist, Tony Leo, founder and co-CEO of JobGet, and welcome back to the Language of Business. Thank you very much for having me. Tell us, how did you get this amount of success? Yeah, I would say that our success came from the fact that we're able to connect the community uh, with the local employers and the local candidates together in such a short amount of time. So within seven months, we've helped more than 10,000 job seekers in Boston find jobs across more than 1,200 businesses here. Do you think that it was the metrics of dem demonstrable success that impressed the judges? Is it your energy? Is it your, you were your three co-founders advantages? What, what do you think was the it factor? Yeah, I would say that it's a mix of both the amount of traction as well as the strength of the team. So the amount of traction really helped us get on the map by helping more than 10,000 candidates as well as more than 1,200 businesses. At the same time, we also have a very strong core founding team. So myself, I come from a finance and strategy background. Yep. My co-founder, he used to own two retail stores. Yep, nice. And my third co-founder, he used to lead a tech team in Silicon Valley. So the three of us combined was able to create this um, very complementary team that helped us drive the success. But how do three people get along? Fantastic. I mean, we, we have different personalities, but very cohesive personalities. So it's not often two against one? Oh, never, never. We're always on the same page on everything. At the same time, we often play devil's advocate, but at the same time, we also um, we come to an agreeable conclusion. How much doubt, if any, did you have seven months ago, three months ago, or now you were going to do so well? Um, that's very interesting. I would say that in the beginning, we've always knew that we tapped onto a very big market because since we launched, although we launched seven months ago, we have been doing customer interviews and you know, product reviews through the course of last year. So we knew that we were onto something, sure. um, but obviously this has been a very pleasant surprise. And it sounds like you've had a fantastic month. You were also a finalist at the Inclusive Innovation Challenge at MIT, and it also sounds like you've been professionally funded. Tell us about both of those, please. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. Um, so it's been a tremendous month for us. 
Uh, we also won the MIT Inclusive Innovation Challenge as a North America winner. And now we are down to the final four for a chance to win $250,000. So fingers crossed for that. At the same time, we are also supported by um, very strong groups of VCs. Um, and I think we will be announcing um, our overall round over the coming month as well. Um, so I think that's a very, very, very strong indication for us. What do you see the next six to 12 months being like for JobGet? The six to 12 months um, will be focused on growth. So now that we have this great support, we have this great traction, and we have the team in place, our focus is to bring JobGet to saturate the rest of the Boston market, as well as bring our platform across the rest of the US over the next coming year. And the 50,000 that you've won at Mass Challenge, and hopefully we'll keep our fingers crossed as well, the 250 from MIT, directly what would those funds be used for? Yes, so one of our biggest focus is getting involved in communities. So with a $50,000 prize from Mass Challenge, as well as a potential 250,000 from MIT, we look to invest in hiring community leaders that will you know, step into the various communities of Boston to help individuals onboard them not only to the platform, but to teach them in terms of career management, in terms of advancement, and to really get integrated with communities here in Boston. If you were to become, as of tomorrow, uh, a mentor and you were no longer uh, running JobGet, what two or three pieces of advice would you be for? Uh, would you give to prospective mass challenge companies? It's a very interesting question. I would say that first is grit. Um, I think the successful trade of any entrepreneur grid is above all. Um, there are going to be numerous days where there's going to be downs and there's going to be up days. But no matter what happens, you have to persevere through everything. Um, and everything's going to be different every single day. So having that grit really helps. Um, secondly is building the right team. So it's not about finding you know, the most successful people or the, most, or the smartest people in the room. It's about finding the right people and the right fit. I think that's, that's really helpful towards any you know, startup budding entrepreneurs. You mentioned one of your co-founders has done a couple of startups before. How much did that contribute to the overall success of your team? Yeah, I, th I think both my co-founders have, um, have experience in either startups or their own businesses. So one of my co-founders, he actually ran two retail stores. Right. So he understood you know, very well of how a company grows from the beginning to the end. And he has an operational background as well as network in the area. Um, so he brought you know, that tremendous amount of experience in that aspect. My second co-founder, he actually led a team in the Silicon Valley on the tech side. So he, you know, he's very well versed in all the potential bugs or all the potential hurdles that may come. And he's also very well versed in how to scale a technology product from the beginning to the end. So I think it's been tremendous. Outside of growing your company, what advice would you give to a first or, in your team's case, second or third time entrepreneur in terms of growing the firm? In terms of growing the firm, I would say that the best advice I would have is to have a measured approach. A lot of entrepreneurs can get in over their heads by trying to grow as fast as possible, and we've seen a lot of failures correlated with just growing too fast. So I would say that really understanding your product fit, um, making sure that your existing customers are very happy, and take a managed approach to growth rather than just going all in. Tony, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. Tony Leo, co-founder and CEO of JobGet, and a huge congratulations on your win here at Mass Challenge. And Tony Liu and JobGet not only won the $50,000 Mass Challenge Gold Award, they also won the global grand prize of $250,000 at the MIT Inclusive Innovation Competition. Congratulations. Support for the language of business is from Boston University Questrom School of Business. We're also available as a podcast on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for watching.